Thanks so much for coming again. I'm Mike Boucher. Uh, welcome to On the Issues. This is our regular series of conversations with newsmakers and policy shapers. And today we're very uh, fortunate to have a, a gentleman who has a, um, well, quite a resume, uh, to be uh, accurate to say, Dennis Archer. Let's please give him a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. Uh, the gentleman next to me has has really a remarkable uh, a list of accomplishments. But you began as a school teacher, right? Yes. Yeah, in, in Detroit. In Detroit. Absolutely. Yeah. My first job, however, was a caddy on the golf course, <laughs> Park Shore Golf Course in Cassopolis, Michigan, which Harold back there knows about. And um, I set pins in a bowling alley, and um, then I used to walk about a mile, about. Four o'clock in the morning to our one block long Main Street. Cassopolis, by the way, is population about 1,500. Um, I went back recently, the population is 1,900. And by the way, it's not because they had a bunch of children, it's because they extended the village limits. <laughs> <laughs> Annexation after, always works. Yeah, but exactly. after graduation from college, my first professional job was as a teacher of learning disabled students in Detroit public schools. He has also been a uh Michigan Supreme Court Justice. He has also been the mayor of Detroit from 1994 to 2001. He was the president of the National League of Cities, I recall. He was the president of the American Bar Association, uh, the first African-American president of the American Thanks Bar Thanks to Gail Leone. She's one of my Gail big Leone supporters. <laughs> and uh, he was the uh, interesting part of his life. He was the, the legal guardian uh, for Rosa Parks, a civil rights pioneer at the end of her life. And uh, currently, he is chairman of uh, Dickinson Wright, a, a law firm with offices both in Detroit and Washington. So you're a busy guy, uh, and there's a lot to talk about. But I'd like to begin by talking about the town you love, Detroit. Uh, we hear a lot about the troubled times facing Americans. Uh, I want to get your sense of how Detroit is doing at this moment. From what perspective? Let me ask you this. The economy, is it? Is it as bad as we read, or is that something of a, an inaccurate perception? Of no, the I city? think it's worse than what you read. Michigan has one of the highest unemployment rates in the United States at about 10.96%. Uh, in the city of Detroit, uh, what that equates to as a general rule is about 25% of our people who live in the city of Detroit are unemployed. And when you factor in the age group of 19 to 34 years of age, 18 to 34, you're looking at an unemployment rate of somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. So the numbers inside the city of Detroit is considerably higher in terms of people who are not working. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of that is because, regrettably, a lot of people live below poverty, and regrettably, um, because young people make uh, a bad decision about not focusing in on getting a good quality education, they drop out of high school. And then we have a fairly high percentage of people who've gone through the criminal justice system. And in times like these, when you're competing for a job and someone has a criminal record and someone doesn't, the person who doesn't have the criminal record is likely to get the job or a better opportunity than one who doesn't. So a lot of it is because of that reason. The auto industry, um, there, there's a lot of debate in our country about what should be done about the auto industry and, and, and what would happen if a, a Chrysler were to fail or a GM file for bankruptcy. Um, how precarious is the situation for Detroit with the existing industry, with the automobile industry? Well, first of all, let me just say up front, I'm a Democrat. And having said that, when you take a look at what occurred in 2001 after the uh, horrific loss of life and the attack on our country, people just came to a standstill. People were afraid to fly. No one was buying anything big. Las Vegas, New Orleans, a great city, wonderful restaurants. Nobody was going. 
in an industry that you would think would be reasonably safe, hotels, service industries, casinos, etc., everybody was taking a real big hit. And just before 9-11, you might recall where Daimler Chrysler said that they were going to lose some 26,000 men and women. And as a result of that, 20,000 by retirement and another 6,000 by buyout and by way of attrition. And they were just coming out of that. And where Montgomery Ward went out of business and Kmart, and another Michigan company, was having its struggles, seemingly everything was coming out. Then 9-11 hit, and then everything came to a standstill. General Motors in my view, save the United States from a very deep recession or a huge or small depression. Why? Because what they decided to do was to go to zero financing for their cars and trucks. Ford and Chrysler followed suit. And then other retailers said, you know, that's a good idea. Let's reduce this. Let's make it available for people to buy and make it easier. And so people start buying again in the economy. When Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors started experiencing the challenges uh, that gave rise to a request for a bridge loan, they tried desperately to meet with the President of the United States. It was not until President Bush was in his eighth year of office that he meet with the Big Three. Senator John McCain came out of that same um, sense of let the uh, marketplace uh, decide what's best. And so I think uh, the automobile industry clearly is going to turn itself around. And I think President Obama has a better sense of what it means if Chrysler, Ford, or General Motors were to go into, in this case, Chrysler or General Motors, either one would go into bankruptcy. And here's what I mean. We've got a number of Tier 1 automobile suppliers who are really on the bubble. A couple of weeks ago, for example, Vistion had a $16 million check that had to be written to cover um, the interest or whatever was on some bonds, and um, they were being delisted or were delisted from the New York Stock Exchange because their stock was less than a dollar. But they were able to make those payments. And what I'm reading in the paper now is that the task force that President Obama has in play is going to be taking a look at the um, other uh, tier one, two, and three uh, suppliers to the automobile industry, where I think Senator Shelby and uh, Cocker are misplaced in their thoughts is that because they've got uh, Mercedes, perhaps BMW, Nissan, Honda, Toyota in their respective states, that they're okay. But the reality of it is, uh, Mike, when you think about it, is that if one of the Tier 1 automobile suppliers happen to go under, it will impact the supplies and the parts that uh, the other uh, that I just named, Mercedes, Mercedes-Benz, Honda, Toyota, they're all going to be impacted. And by the way, when you read about car dealerships, uh, both uh, General Motors and Chrysler, as well as Ford looking at how they're going to reduce the number of dealerships. There are 14,000 dealerships uh, with connected to the automotive big three. They have